Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with the voice of NASA, Mr. Hugh Harris. Welcome, Hugh Harris. Thanks for having me. Well, good to have you here. We are going to have Hugh Harris on the beginning of the month to talk about the shuttles of the month are, are here on Stay Curious. And today we're going to particularly focus on STS-41B with a, a great crew that did behind me here. Mr. Harris is the MMU floating in space up there is uh, uh, Stewart, uh, Robert Stewart, who took the second turn. Bruce McCandless, of course, did the first on this historic mission. And Hugh Harris is here to tell us a little bit about the public relations for that, as he was the voice of NASA uh, to many of the world's television networks uh, and spent 35 years in NASA telling the story of the space program. And we're so glad to have you here. How are you? Well, I'm doing fine since I'm alive. Good. <laughs> Tell everybody how old you are. You told me you're, or how young you are, your age. Well, I'm only 80, 89. 89. So and... I'm not, I'm one year younger than Vance Brand. Okay, yeah, Vance Brand on, on STS-41B uh, we're going to talk about. I uh, was the commander uh, and a friend of our museum also. Uh, we, we, I'll tell you a funny story about Vance coming in here and nobody knew who he was and and because uh, his hair was so long. Right. <laughs> and uh, that was a couple years ago. But uh, I'm particularly thrilled to have Mr. Hugh Harris with us, being a fellow journalist myself and and uh, uh, spent my chops with the Associated Press uh, in the trenches with a camera and stuff in the 70s and 80s. And I uh, really admire this man, you know, a job that I would have liked to have had, the public uh, uh, relations officer for for NASA. But to uh, tell you a little bit about Hugh, and I'll let him, we're going to comment about some of these missions. Um, 35 years with NASA, though he's best known for his public calm and professional commentary on the progress of launch preparations and the launch of space shuttles in the 80s and 90s. His primary accomplishments were directing an outreach program for the general public, uh, news media, students, educators, as well as business and government leaders. You were, in a sense, the, the, uh, the outlet for the world to get their materials about NASA. And you're also proud of your creation of the Chroniclers, which is the, uh, another history chapter of NASA. Tell us a little about, about uh, looking back. He was the third director of public affairs at, at Kennedy Space Center. Well, one of the things that people don't recognize as much is that the news media are as much a part of NASA and what happens uh, as anybody else. And I could not have done my job, of course, without the, uh, the news media. And one of the things that the, uh, is, is very important is that the news media are not the enemy of any organization unless they make them the enemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, by getting to know people and getting to uh, take care of the, the, their needs, and my background in uh, journalism, among others, uh, I think prepared me for that because I knew what the uh, media needed in order to accomplish their job. And in return, uh, they were happy uh, to do that. Uh, I think that we had probably as good a relationship with the media during the period that I was uh, active. And by the way, I'm still active. You mentioned one of the uh, things I was proudest of was the Chroniclers, mm -hmm. which is a way to honor the media and to recognize the contributions that they made. And there are NASA programs that would not have been approved by Congress if the media had not been talking about what a good idea it was to do them. And um, the, uh, 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 well. Is there an outlet uh, for your chroniclers? Is that a, a website? No, or, uh, it, well, there it is. There is a website uh, as part of the uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center mm -hmm. uh, website that has the chroniclers on it. Really, it's uh, 
uh, it really is very simple. It involves putting the names of, uh, of people who have done a great job in their profession on the wall at the press site. And uh, when I conceived of the Chroniclers originally, uh, NASA headquarters uh, uh, said, well, we, we like the idea, but why don't you go and do it? So I made the rules that the media that were going to become chroniclers had to do their job from the Kennedy Space Center. Okay. And uh, as far as I know, they're not doing uh, uh, it in any other NASA center. But one of the things I'm proudest of is establishing the volunteer program for retirees, both civil service and contractors, to come back and work for free uh, yeah. out at the center, because that way we preserve the knowledge that they have of the programs, and they also feel uh, that they're still making a contribution. So I still have a badge mm -hmm. after almost 60 years with NASA. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, talking with Hugh Harris, so pleased that he's here in our studio in downtown Titusville, in our Stay Curious uh, studio here. Uh, there's some chroniclers out there watching us, Tom and Mark Usiak, the brother photographers that from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, you're familiar with. We're going to yes. see some of their work here on the show today. Well, they, they do great work. One of the, the rules, though, of chroniclers are that they have to be retired. And I'm not sure that they're retired yet. Uh, and that is so that there's no appearance of favoritism uh, or- Okay, while well, they're working press in there. Yes. And, uh, uh, well, Tom's kind of retired. Mark is, uh, uh, he does a lot of, lot of uh, comes down here. He's looking to come down here to see the rollout of the uh, Artemis rocket. So we say hi to you guys out there. We had a, a like from uh, Mr. Tip Talone, hope he's watching, that you were going to be on the program today on our tease of this program. So many of you uh, commenting and anxious to see uh, Mr. Harris, and uh, we're going to have him on at the beginning of every month to go over a few of the, the main shuttle uh, launches of that month. Well, let me just say something about Tip. Sure. The uh, Tip is one of the great people who make what happens in space possible. And uh, they very rarely get the, uh, uh, the credit that they deserve mm -hmm. for putting together the millions of parts that go into a, a rocket and a spacecraft and then managing all of the thousands of people that work on them. And Tip was a great manager and made a tremendous contribution to the uh, space program. Well, good. We hope to get him on Stay Curious someday, as, as Marty and I are reaching out to all kinds of people this month to fill out our program, and we've got a lot of good ideas headed for this year. But we're going to kick it off here a little bit, because we love space history, and we love keeping up uh, with the shuttles orbiting Earth, but also space history, where we've got Apollo 14 headed back from the third landing on the moon at this time with uh, Al Shepard, Stu Rosa, and Edgar Mitchell. Uh, but also, there's a, there's a picture of you. you Got to put a handsome shot of Hugh up there uh, a few years ago. You rocked a mustache for quite a while, didn't you, out there? Well, I <laughs> for a couple of years, I, I grew that uh, for a play that I was in in Cleveland because I, I grew up in Cleveland, uh -huh. and, although I Went to New Go York. Go Buckeyes. <laughs> I grew up in Finley. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, uh, but uh, I just didn't shave it off for a couple of years after that picture was taken, well, which was for STS-1, I believe. Well, we're going to show, yeah, STS-1, that was 40 years ago then, uh, that th this uh, picture of you there. Uh, we, you were, uh, uh, and what position were you working then? You were in the in the public relations pool, you became the, uh, well, as I uh, consult my shuttle scroll here, uh, you were in 95, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, 80, 83, become assistant director. 
well, I, at, at the time I was the branch chief uh, in charge of the press site. Okay. And uh, so I got to work with the, uh, the media, which I've always loved working with them. Big and small media, you're dealing with the Walter Cronkite's of the world and then the, the Titusville uh, and Orlando newspaper people, right? Well, they're important too. Good. Yeah. <laughs> The people, as a matter of fact, one of the, the tragedies in this country at the moment is the loss of small news, newspapers. Oh, absolutely. Because, and, uh, and also uh, the consolidation of the big ones so that uh, the newspapers that are, for instance, a couple hundred miles away now from here uh, belong to the same company uh, that has the newspaper, the Florida Today, mm -hmm. and uh, it's part of a huge uh, group. And um, I've always been a, a fan, uh, maybe because I started my newspaper career at a small newspaper, is that it's important, people are the most important things there are in our lives and in the life of our country. And you really have to be on the, the the scene and recognize what they're doing, both good and bad. And um, I once was uh, involved in uh, uh, having a, a whole um, a board of education quit uh, because <laughs> of some of the stories about uh, what they were doing at the time. On the other hand, I'd like to think that I was on the side of a lot of people being preserved in office uh, when they were doing the right things. Well, you're, I'm just like you. I don't know how people know what's going on at city council meetings and school board meetings because I was a reporter for those things, and mm -hmm. they were important and always a front-page story about the city leashing cats or raising the, the garbage fee or something, you know. And uh, now I guess it's social media, but we're going to uh, uh, have you on, uh, uh, like I said, at the beginning of the month, March 1st, we'll have you back on on a Tuesday. These are our shuttles of uh, February there, and uh, quite a quite an array of shuttles there that, uh, ironically, three of them launched on February 3rd. We just had two launch on February 7th, STS-98, which is one of my favorite logos. Uh, and STS-122, uh, a few years later, uh, both going to the International Space Station to do hard hat missions. And um, we'll be talking about uh, STS-30, another STS-30 took up the cupola to the space station uh, after you'd retired. Uh, and we've got a Hubble telescope uh, repair in there this month, Hugh. And uh, Andy Allen, who is, uh, was, uh, uh, is now an executive uh, in the Artemis world. Uh, he was uh, commander of STS-75. We've had Andy Allen on our show here. STS-133, the end of discovery. And then 36 is on February 28th. And 36 was a, a Department of Defense mission. And you didn't know very much about those, did you, Hugh? Well, I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> okay, and, good. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, you know, we weren't really supposed to uh, hardly talk about them. And they were quite different from the regular mission. In a, on a regular mission, uh, I felt my job when I was a commentator was to let people know sort of on a minute-by-minute -minute basis what was going on out on the pad and in getting ready. In the case of a DOD mission, we weren't able to even say where we were in the countdown or what time mm -hmm. it was going to count or uh, launch. And at that time, um, we did have uh, spy ships out there in the Atlantic off of uh, uh, the Cape uh, who were watching uh, and waiting to uh, see uh, what was going to go up. Mm. Would you have a military officer beside you and say, okay, now you can start your, now you can talk into the microphone to the the world about the countdown or how'd that go? Well, actually, I decided that for myself uh, pretty much. Well, I, I, you know, I knew what the rules were and I just followed them. 
Yeah, well, in uh, the media, you got to follow. Yeah, you, you know when to uh, break the rules and ask mm-hmm. for forgiveness. Well, as and, well as uh, uh, doing. Yeah, you don't mess with the military. <laughs> when, when we got, <laughs> I was in the military. Right, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so I never messed with them. Uh, the uh, when we got close enough, um, and I can't remember. It was after T minus nine minutes. Uh-huh. Uh We were able to say. You know, here's, you know, we count down the rest of it for people to hear. What What's important about that is that uh, people, first, you don't want people to get startled by uh, all of a sudden something happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also the, uh, the ships and the airplanes and all that sort of thing uh, need to know. And while there are... Uh, is information out there saying do not fly into this area or do not travel in this area on your ship um they didn't really know how long that was going to last because they didn't know what time a launch was going to happen Hmm. so when you get close enough though it's a good idea to tell people well it's going to happen (laughs) right and after that they would uh, know that they were able to go back uh, to their normal lives. We're talking with Hugh Harris. I failed to mention my partner in crime, co-producer Marty Winkle. Marty worked on the launch process service on the engines and uh, the computer mm-hmm. area of the uh, the great uh, engines, one of the greatest uh, rocket engines ever made, the SSME. And uh, uh, I, when you're saying about the top secret launches and so forth, I popped in my head that Marty mentioned during one of our shows that uh, the wildlife had no idea well, that when, right. a, when a rocket yeah. was going to go off. So there was quite a lot of birds and noises and stuff like that from the, the, the Merritt Island Wildlife Refuge and so forth being disturbed, particularly the night launches. Well, and, and amazingly, uh, they settled down pretty fast and sort of accepted it <laughs> yeah. as just something that happened. <laughs> well, only stories like this you're going to hear from uh, on Stay Curious from people like Hugh Harris that we're so happy to have uh, uh, joining our, our team here. And we want to shout out to Jessica Galloway, our Trekkie Techie. She helped Marty and I, two old men, learn a couple new tricks here of how to pull this off. She's always in the background if we need you and love you, Jesse, for all that you've done for us. Uh, we've got, uh, but we want to kick off a, a little bit of space history, Hugh, that uh, 48 years ago today, Skylab 4 was splashed down just off the coast of uh, California, spending 84 days, a record that stood for four years till the Russians broke it. This is a very rare photo of them on the the uh the uh USS New Orleans I think it was and left is uh Ed Gibson uh Ed we're trying to effort uh Ed to get him on here uh one day uh he's he's writing finishing up a uh sci-fi thriller novel and I'm just about to finish his second novel two mm-hmm. thirty years ago where the protagonist is a a, a renegade astronaut called Joe Ribello. <laughs> and so, Ed Gibson, I'm looking to talk to Joe Ribello. Please give me a, sh- a shout out there. And in the middle, you got Bill Pogue and the commander, Jerry Carr, and they grew beards on this. And that was very unusual for them to, for astronauts to grow beards in space and not cut them off before they came down. Harrison Schmidt and, and Gene Cernan had a pretty full growth uh, when they got back in the command module. Uh, after their uh, three days on the moon. But uh, there they are, uh, 48 years ago today. Um, I wanted to point out that they that the Apollo spacecraft was designed, sometimes they flipped over. Hugh, you're going, you've been in outer space for 84 days. Then you go through re-entry. And before gravity can even take over, you're flipped over and your 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 seat belts are throwing you forward and you're probably vomiting from sea motion and everything i mean what a these guys went through a lot of stuff and then you had these airbags that flipped you over right away and there's frogmen uh retrieving this is, happens to be skylab three uh and not four which you i'm going to go to the crew here just to mention this was skylab four to the engineering people of nasa 
But as you see on the patch, it's Skylab 3 with a 3 outlining there that the media called them. What a confusing thing where they called Skylab 1 the engineers, the right. actual Skylab space station, mm -hmm. and Skylab 2 was the first crew, but the media went 1, 2, 3. How'd that happen? You know anything about a backstory of that at all? No, I just assumed that the media knew how to count. They decided that it was only when there were people involved and on board that the real work was being done. That's a good point, because they, they didn't call any other uh, unmanned spacecraft uh, a program number whether it be Gemini or, or uh, Apollo. Well, we did a lot of messing around with numbers, especially yes. during the shuttle. Oh, era. yeah, we're going to talk about this. As, <laughs> as we have few on we, month after month, we'll get into some of this, uh, these uh, little uh, uh, anecdotes and, and things that crop up from time to time. But I want to point that out. So there you are with the great George Page, who was, uh, uh, he, he segued from Apollo era to the shuttle, mm -hmm. tell, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you remember about this picture and, and Mr. Page a little bit. Well, this, of course, uh, was celebrating a successful uh, completion, I believe, of uh, stacking and rolling out to the pad, although this could have been an anniversary. Okay. And I sort of forgotten, uh, but... Uh, in, in any case, George, George was a really tough manager. And um, he not only um, would pay attention to what time everybody came to work, oh. but he also was not real happy to see me uh, in the firing room. They, because uh, I was the only one in the firing room, as far as I know, unless they were hiding, uh, who, you know, didn't have an actual role in uh, pushing buttons and uh, keeping track of what was going on uh, uh, technically. And um, he had a, a barrier erected, which looks a lot like what we have for uh, COVID nowadays, uh, so that uh, the person next to me, which happened to be usually the uh, payload manager and uh, frequently was John Conway, uh, could, uh, didn't, uh, you know, be put off by listening to what I was saying. Uh, mm -hmm. However, his other rule was that I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody else in the uh, firing room. And um, that was a real problem on STS-1, because you may recall that STS-1 uh, stopped, uh, the countdown was stopped uh, before we got to uh, uh, engine ignition, thankfully. But uh, at, the, at the time it happened, uh, no one, uh, well, in public affairs, uh, had any idea as to why that happened. And the, I had people on the telephone that I could talk to uh, and they didn't know either. Mm -hmm. So it was um, not you know, that sort of flying blind and whether you're doing commentary. Wow, yeah. Well, he was, you <clears throat> know, those uh, Apollo era guys were tough and, and didn't take any nonsense because they, they, they knew, you know, uh, things, bad things could happen, I guess. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's really a, 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 a unique history. Well, they, they were dedicated, mm -hmm. and there are many a time that uh, many of them slept overnight uh, right at their place where they were working mm -hmm. in order so, to uh, go on. So I gather you were always on promptly on time to work uh, when George was around. George Page. Were well, he, he wasn't my boss. So oh, okay. <laughs> he, he didn't care if I ever came in, I oh. don't think. Yeah. <laughs> Marty, we've got a comment. We've got several, but this one is uh, Tom Usiak is saying the picture was from ST, after STS-1. Okay. Well, after uh, Tom Usiak took this picture, and he said it was after STS-1's landing or launch on there, in there. And we've got uh, Larry Pusker's watching. He's in Michigan. So's Dave Stang's in Michigan. 
We've got Esog Nanja watching, Jamie Orange. Christopher Mick is a, a STEAM educator in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, uh, hello, Iman Cregan. We haven't seen you for a while. Hi from Ireland, Iman. He was a regular watcher. Melissa Pope is watching down at our mm -hmm. Space Coast Office of Tourism. And Jamie Orange says, thank you so much, Hugh, for everything you have done for NASA. So we appreciate that. Carol Cavanaugh's on there also. And she had a major role in uh, Carol the, Cavanaugh? Yes, in oh. the in the work that we did in public affairs. All right. So I'm well, glad she's watching. Great. Glad that she's we have all kinds of people watching Stay Curious around the world, Hugh. And we are sure that this will enhance our, our viewership by having people like you on here that uh, folks, I'm just as excited as an astronaut on here talking to Mr. Harris because uh, I'm a journalism guy and and uh, I, I love hearing his stories. And yes, usually the police chief didn't want me in the the room or the the, the mayor <laughs> when they had some some you know things that they wanted to not necessarily hide, but that they're so worried you'd misinterpret things, right? Right. Yeah. It, it was it was like you don't understand that, but. We'll talk a lot more about that. Next picture up here is you uh, with the big worm logo. It's, it's something going on. Now, Tom Usiak again took this picture. Bob Seek, launch director, is second from the right there. And, uh, of course, he's a great uh, uh, outgoing treasurer of our, on our board, Bob Seek. But we wanted to talk a little bit about this mission, Challenger 41B. And... Uh, like you alluded to, how messed up can a numbering system get to where the NASA number crunchers wanted to keep track of the fiscal years that these spacecraft were launched, which goes from October to October. So the four on this is for 1984, all right, and the one is launched from Kennedy Space Center. Two was going to be... Um, uh, Vandenberg, but they never launched any from Vandenberg. And the B is sort of like it's the second in line of that fiscal year, correct? Hugh? That, that's right. And uh, that kind of, you probably got a lot of questions about that, particularly from international people, or, or how'd that, that fly for well, about 16 missions from STS-9 to uh, the, the, the Challenger disaster? Well, we, we got a lot of questions from all the people who worked out there because it would have been much easier to call it SDS 1, 2, 3, 4. And I think the reason it changed was they got to 13. And 13 was unlucky number. unlucky number in, in some people's uh, mm -hmm. thoughts. And also it had been a uh, uh, unlucky in the case of Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. So they uh, they decided, well, we'll do something smarter and we won't have a 13. And so that that's sort of how it got changed. Well, here is that crew, uh, Tom Usiak, another great photo that Tom took. Uh, uh, we've got uh, left, this is quite an all-star crew. Uh, left to right there, you've got, uh, that's Bruce McCandless. You've got, um, yeah, that's uh, Robert uh, uh, Stewart, Stewart beside him, Ron McNair, his flight before he lost his life in Challenger, Hoot Gibson, uh, and then uh, a pilot, and the commander is Vance Brandt, former Apollo Soyuz, and, and he'd already flown uh, two shuttles at this time, or, or one shuttle at this time. All four of them were rookies. And Vance Brand, that's that's quite a, a a crew to give a responsibility of the man maneuvering unit. What do you remember about those guys? Well, they're they're all great guys, but the uh, and and every one of them is interesting. Uh, I I would have thought that in the uh, the case of um, uh, Bruce McCandless, that he might have been a lot more. Uh, concerned uh, about leaving the spacecraft. He was the first uh, human who ever flew in space without having a sort of solid spacecraft uh, mm -hmm. uh, under him. And they, But he had spent almost 20 years working on uh, with the people on the man maneuvering unit. And uh, so he said he was not worried at all uh, when I talked to him. 
And um, he also, by the way, was the only astronaut that ever stayed overnight at my house. Really? Well, he <laughs> he came down at the last minute for a launch, uh, not his launch. And um, every motel room and uh, rooming house or whatever they were uh, from uh, uh, from here to uh, you know past Daytona Beach mm -hmm. over to Orlando was taken. Uh, so we invited him to stay and he was a great guest and um, he uh, sent back a picture of him flying uh, uh, loose in space uh, to my wife. Uh, and I think that's the one picture she has that she treasures the most. Really? Wow. So in your home, your is your wife, Cora. You live on Merritt Island. Do you, uh, you live on Merritt Island? Cocoa Beach. Oh, Cocoa really. Beach. Okay. Uh, uh, do you still surf? Uh, <laughs> you still out there at your as, trip for you? <laughs> as, as much as I ever did, which as, oh, was, was not at all. Okay. All right. Uh, here is, uh, this happens to be uh, uh, Robert Stewart, actually, on the man maneuvering unit. Um, and I've left a sheet over there of, of a quote there. And Steve Izzo, our docent of the day, would you, there's some white paper there. Uh, not that one. Yeah, that one would be good. Well, and I got uh, another one. Uh, Stewart was a very interesting no, 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 person. That's good. Oh, that's yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Stuart there. Let's, we'll talk. We'll see a picture of him. We've got the launch there. Uh, another Tom UCX special. They were great guys. Good photographers. Yeah, they they, they great are. Professional. Well, they still are. They yeah. do. Yeah, absolutely. Still are. <laughs> and uh, there they are training in a water tank. This is McCandless uh, the second. Two Roman numerals behind his name. You Google Bruce McCandless like I did, you're going to come up with his father, who was a World War II Medal of Honor mm -hmm. recipient. And uh, we lost Bruce McCandless uh, December 2017, uh, four and a half years ago at age 80. And there he is. He was a Apollo era astronaut. He waited 19 years to fly. And uh, he, he segued from Apollo uh, 14, he was one of the, not the official backup, but one of the backup, backup crew on 14. Then he went into the Skylab program. Uh, and I've read a couple things where it, uh, he, he really hung around a long time and some people may have given up. Well, he, and, and yes, that could have happened, but he also was the first one, uh, to fly as some of them called it, uh, in the, manipulator arm foot restraint unit mm -hmm. and uh i i think it's uh very interesting um from the standpoint that there had been a uh a wardrobe malfunction uh that um uh the um uh that the person who was supposed to uh, fly, and I've forgotten his name right this second, mm -hmm. <laughs> but... You um, uh, uh, can look it up there in a minute and come back to it. The, uh, in any case, uh, when they tried on their uh, suit, the uh, boots and um, the, uh, the leg things that went uh, up over their ankle inflated more than they were supposed to, and they couldn't get into the foot restraints on the uh, remote manipulator arm. Mm. As a result, uh, then Bruce, uh, whose feet had not swollen up like that, mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't from uh, you know something wrong with the feet, it was the uh, air pressure in them, uh, got to be the first one who uh, got on the remote manipulator arm and was moved around the uh, mm. uh, the outside Cargo of the there. spacecraft, and um, however, the uh, that was solved by what was used frequently going back to the beginning of the rocket program with duct tape. Duct tape and <laughs> duct tape was used in a lot of different ways, 
And in this particular case, uh, uh, Stuart uh, duct taped the, uh, his feet so they wouldn't expand. And then he was able to get out there and do his thing on the remote manipulator arm. And then also he got to uh, uh, fly free in space. Yeah, we're going to see a picture of him flying free right there. And uh, uh, the equal sign, Marty, there we go. That's a, one of the un, more uh, least publicized photos out there of him on his spacewalk. And he, he said about this, quote, I was grossly overtrained. And you said he spent over ten years on this. well twenty years I think uh, pretty much. I was just uh, anxious to get out there and fly. I felt very comfortable. It got so cold, my teeth were chattering, and I was shivering. But that was a minor thing. An astronaut, <laughs> okay. Uh, I've been told of the quiet vacuum. I, he goes. I've been told of the quiet vacuum you experience in space, but with three radio links all in my ears saying, "How's your oxygen holding up? Stay away from the engines." Uh, when's my turn? Uh, it wasn't that peaceful, uh, McCandless said. It was a wonderful feeling, a mix of personal elation and professional pride. It had taken many years to get to that point. And uh, uh, this is 48 years ago yesterday when he experienced this. He was out there for six hours uh, mm -hmm. doing this uh, untethered spacewalk. Uh, and uh, then... Uh, um, Stewart used the same M M MMU on the second EVA, and that lasted almost six hours for him. And they landed February 11th, 1984, after eight days Challenger, making the first landing on the runway at Kennedy Space Center. And we'll bring you a picture of that on the 11th that Mark Usiek took. Tell us about that landing out at Kennedy Space Center instead of Edwards Air Force Base. Do you remember how exciting that was? Well, I, I was excited because I didn't have to fly out to Vandenberg, uh, or to, out to, rather, uh, Edwards, uh, Edwards uh, for the landing, and uh, which I had done uh, previously. Mm -hmm. But the, um, it, was, it, it made so much sense uh, and saved so many dollars uh, to have the spacecraft, uh, the shuttle, come back to KSC, where it then is just towed to the hangar, processed for another flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, one of the things that uh, uh, it, that, that was created for was to have frequent flights. And uh, you had mentioned um, uh, the, um, uh, before the uh, uh, commander on, uh, on that uh, flight uh, and what they they had been doing. Well, uh, Vance Brand yeah, on this Vance flight. Brand, yeah. um, he had, um, during his career, he actually uh, had uh, worked on uh, the uh, a, having a, a single rocket spacecraft that could take off, fly in space, come back and land. Hmm. Um, and um, that never came to fruition, but it was interesting that uh, uh, he was able to um, uh, get to the uh, the shuttle program, mm -hmm. and uh, which yeah, is the closest he, we've come to that. Exactly, he was quite a, uh, quite a guy. <laughs> Testing the MMU for the first time in space required a lot of focus and bravery, uh, but McCainless and Stewart had faith in the hardware. Folks, you are an orbiting satellite inside your own little spaceship, and I mean, uh, it's it, it, it just with no tether. And then, then they went and used this on F, uh, STS-41C when Pinky Nelson went out and grabbed the uh, an errant satellite out there. 24 small compression nitrogen thrusters, two motion controlled handles on either armrest, and it weighed about 300 pounds. It was developed by engineer Charles Whitsett, and McCandless tested it underwater and inside the space station Skylab. Also, this uh, mm -hmm. it was tested. I, I, I meant to grab a picture of the astronauts testing it in Skylab. It was so voluminous they could, inside the Skylab, they could do it. 
and the Martin Marietta Aerospace uh, produced the final version of this. And then the, NASA kind of scrapped it uh, after finding its worthiness and so forth. It, it, it didn't fly, but it was going to sort of be a rescue thing, wasn't it, at one time? Well, that and, and it was used uh, as far as rescuing a satellites were mm -hmm. concerned. So, and it was used, uh, I believe, on servicing of Hubble, uh, although I'm a little hazy on that. Mm -hmm. But the um, that was, uh, uh, I think, an exciting thing. And uh, uh, certainly people uh, uh, who watched movies were, uh, I think, a little worried, will that person be allowed back in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. There are too many science fiction movies about <laughs> locking you out. Well, we're talking with Hugh Harris, public affairs office officer for NASA over 35 years, uh, an illustrious career of dealing with astronauts and the space program. Uh, we have a comment, Marty. Yeah, uh, Tom Usiak says, Coop Gibson took the series of the free-flying MMU photos, their classics. Oh, okay. These classic photos. Hoot Gibson, he said, took those. Yes, and they uh, they thanked Hoot a lot, and they've mentioned him many times during the years. Uh, 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 Bruce did, and and also Stewart, uh, on uh, his ability with uh, cameras. Really, it was a telephoto lens obviously used there? They they uh, uh, there there's uh, another beautiful shot that happens to be Stewart. Uh, there, I don't see the stripes on his legs there, uh, maybe that uh, McCandless had. Uh, and there is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Robert Stewart there. He is 79 years old. He was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, NASA, after the Skylab, in fact, Skylab 4 or 3, did the last spacewalk uh, to retrieve film. I always like showing the film. <laughs> so that our young readers out there, they, mm -hmm. to get the data mm -hmm. from the Skylab Solar Telescope, they had to risk their lives grabbing the film, which was about this big on a spool. <laughs> uh, but we didn't do another spacewalk until uh, ST, uh, for eight years. And that was STS-6 with um, uh, Story Musgrave and uh, uh, Peterson, mm -hmm. uh, who's passed mm -hmm. away. And then, and then, so this was a big deal. We weren't doing a lot of spacewalks uh, up to this point uh, in the shuttle era. And uh, so, and there's another beautiful shot of, of just an iconic image uh, of man in space floating around there. And there's the crew again. Uh, uh, we were talking about Vance Brand sitting down. Hoot Gibson's got the mustache. This was his first flight, I think, of uh, five or six. Interestingly, I always think interesting that Hugh Gibson, when he retired as a NASA astronaut, became a Southwest air, air pilot, mm -hmm. commercial air pilot. Well, uh, some people love to fly. There you go. <laughs> no. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would love to, I'd, be, I'd surely love to fly on anything he was flying on there. Uh, and the McCandless is on the right. Yes, Marty, we got a question. Yeah, Elon Cregan, NASA right. Uh, you, did you have a favorite crew? Uh, obviously Who's not. Who's your favorite crew? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, all of the crews really uh, had the, you know, did their best. And uh, uh, they were only restrained by the fact that they had a specific sort of minute by minute um, uh, schedule that they had to keep to. So uh, you could say, you know, was one more fun than another? Well, if they had a little extra time for fun, you know, maybe they were more fun, but um, they all did a tremendous job. So I really don't have a favorite crew. All right. Well, uh, uh, okay, good, Marty. Yeah, we got Andrew uh, Oliva, uh, uh, Oliva, yeah, Oliva, it's like Tony Oliva, the, the baseball player. Andrew, thanks for watching. He was in the museum Saturday, and I took a picture of him with, with the scroll, my shuttle scroll ah. here. It's got information on it uh, that I can, and I had Hugh sign my scroll today. 
uh, and uh, I'm going to accumulate some signatures on that. Uh, John Bisney's probably watching. You know John. Oh, John, and, uh, yeah, there's uh, a JL great John. Green and their wonderful books. Uh, Marty Umberto, who's been watching, he's a, from Colombia. Uh, mm -hmm. And Linda Marac is from Bothell, uh, Bothell Washington. Uh, John Ronkow Ronkowitz, John Ronkowitz watches from Rutgers, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Kirkman is watching. Uh, he's a jet... Uh, instructor on B737s for United. He studied at Embry-Riddle. Wow. So we love hearing from people there. And uh, Space Resources is on. Robert Katz, hello. Hi, Pam Shivik. Hope you're doing well. And get some good views of that first quarter moon this week. And Jeff Siebert's watching. And we've had Jace and Chris Afoli on are here. Just so many people watching. We want to give them shout outs because we're on public relations like you, Hugh. Uh, um, robots don't watch Stay Curious. People do, right? <laughs> That's right. I used to say, watch, uh, 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 my AP boss said, you know, don't get the backs of heads. They don't, they can't read newspapers. I want to see their eyeballs, you know. And uh, so, uh, but uh, what a sad note here. We want to, to tell some of our friends out there. Uh, in the Grumman uh, Lunar Module community that Marty was a, an electrical engineer on, that uh, Lee Brandt passed away mm. last night. And Lee was a, a, a great uh, supporter of our museum through things he put in our auction. And uh, we want to announce his passing. And Marty, I, I was thinking about Lee today. We did an excellent Stay Curious with him about a year ago, and I'm going to dig that up and we'll air that broadcast uh, for people uh, to hear Lee talk about uh, famously cutting out. They had a leak somewhere on the lunar module. Was it the ascent stage or ascent stage, Marty? Ascent stage, I believe. Uh, on the ascent stage. On and Apollo he, 11. On Apollo 11, and he cut out a big section of it, and it's like lots of layers and threw mm -hmm. it aside, and then he gathered all that up and and uh, uh, sold, uh, sold it through our auction. So. So a lot of people bought some of Lee Brandt's gold mylar out there. And uh, love you, Lee. God bless you. Rest in peace. Uh, uh, Marty knows that I've become very fond of all the, the Grumman workers out there. And and uh, uh, Lee was certainly in his 80s, wasn't he, Marty? Lee was in his 80s. 79. Oh, he's 79. Okay. And uh, you and uh, he and Marty are, are some of the young ones in there. So... Uh, but Lee Brandt passed away, and, and we want to acknowledge that, a great friend of our museum, and uh, he will be missed. So, well, we're going to see what else I got up here. We got the crew there, our shuttles of, of uh, February there. We're going to look at any of the, now you weren't involved in, after, uh, tell us when you retired. Well, I, I never you learned. You never retired, I, I know. That's yeah. right, and I still have a badge, and go out and help with launches. Do you? Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I want to I want to jump in your trunk one day and go out there. <laughs> get in there. Oh. Well, uh, well, we're going to enjoy hearing from uh, you, Hugh Harris, about, about some of these launches as we go along the way. Uh, uh, and every month we're going to feature you on here. And we're so grateful for that. Uh, is there something you'd like to comment and tell our viewers today? Well, keep watching, of course. Okay. And come and see the museum if you haven't been there before. Karen Conklin, our executive director, gave you a very big hug. She was so happy to see you because well, you've done a lot for our museum over the years. Well, she does a great job and the and a tremendous dedication. And we all do. We got a great staff here that we all drank the the Kool Aid that she was making, and uh, <laughs> uh, we were all just so passionate about preserving the birth of the American space program here in its delivery room, Brevard County. And we hope that you're watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, Twitch. Uh, we're even live on Spotify. And then we will be putting some of our shows over on audio podcasts on Google and um, Apple. So, oh, so all kinds great. of platforms to see us there. Tell your friends to like us, share us. Follow us, subscribe to us, and tell them Hugh Harris is in the house, and they can rewatch our video presentation here anytime on the library that is on YouTube and Facebook. So, uh, Hugh, thank you very much, sir. 
Well, really enjoyed uh, breaking the ice here with you. Oh, he was on a, a, a Stay Curious program, more about his history of his uh, uh, illustrious career. And we will always talk about that as we have you on here. So appreciate you all staying curious. And we'll welcome back you uh, March 1st when we do the, the shuttles of March. Thursday, we're going to have Sharon McDougall, who's an African-American spacesuit tech in Houston for a long time. She retired and is now doing a lot of STEAM outreach uh, with uh, sharing her wonderful career. Uh, can't wait to talk to Sharon via uh, Google Meets. I think we're going to do it, uh, but she'll be in Houston and we'll be here talking to her. And she promised she'll come here and see us sometime. So, Hugh, thank you very much. Marty, thank you for all you're doing there. Smooth show. Any final comments out there? We just saw a lot of people's. Oh, yeah. Um, let me find it. Oh, Carol Cavett. Cavett. He was a wonderful boss, a wealth of knowledge. Carol Cavanaugh. A lot of comments like Brown that. nosing to the end there. So. <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear that comment very often. Well, no, Carol, thank you very much. You're, we know what a warm and, and delightful person Hugh is, and he must have been a joy to work for. Maybe you wanted to comment about well, Carol? Yes, work with the, <laughs> the uh, care, uh, many people uh, are like Carol in that they don't realize the talent that they have and their capabilities until you just push a little bit. Okay. Well, you can push me all you want, sir, because we're so pleased to have you part of our Stay Curious program. And like I said, we'll look forward to having you back March 1st and talk about some more space shuttles. And I'll we'll give you a little time to, uh, the, more than this show, to dig into some of the anecdotes that you may have stored up in in that uh, filled up brain of yours of America's space history. So we thank Hugh Harris and we welcome him back and I'll be back tomorrow to bridge the space between us. Thank you.